morning. We have a full service today of exploring and expectation as we look to um, the Advent and celebrating that and looking forward to Christ coming. We, we want to anticipate that. And, uh, a little bit we're going to share com communion together in anticipation of uh, Jesus uh, giving us instructions, reminding us that he will come back. But this morning I want to look um, and continue on in our series of the Apostles' Creed. How many of you had the opportunity this week to look over the Apostles' Creed a couple times? Excellent. There's a few of you. Did it bring up some questions? I don't want to go into all that right now, but um, are there thoughts that came as you read that, or as you went through that? This week we're going to be looking at the first statement in the Apostles' Creed, where it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. This is how it starts. It starts with the beginning, declaring God as to who he is, and affirming him. Let's pray before we move. Lord, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you that we can gather together, that we can worship you, and that we can explore your word, looking at who you are and how you created everything, everything around us. And as we anticipate uh, Christmas, as we anticipate that time of togetherness with family and friends, but also of celebrating you sending your son for each one of us. Lord, it's an exciting time, and it's a time worth celebrating. And so, Lord, this morning, help us to understand a little bit more of who you are through the Apostles' Creed. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to start with exploring, I believe. If I was to come to you and say, what do you believe, what would you say? There's many things that we can believe. And when we look at the word believe, it comes from Greek. Uh, the word is pastuo, which means uh, believe into, or someone, or something. The English word believe has many different meanings. For example, if I was to say, I believe it's going to snow tomorrow, how many of you would boo me? But aside from that, that is... Uh, nothing more than a hunch. I don't know exactly if it's going to snow tomorrow or not. But I could say I believe by the cloud formations and from what I have witnessed that it could snow. <coughs> if I say I believe John A. Macdonald was the first Prime Minister, this, re this refers to a historic belief. It is true. He was. And there's no denying that. But when I say I believe in Jesus with all my heart, this is a different statement that we're making. Believing in Jesus means that I'm trusting in Him completely with my eternal destiny. It means to trust Christ completely. I'm willing to fight for Him. I'm willing to advocate for Him or even die for Him. And how many testimonies have we heard around the world where people have died for Jesus. There's a story told many years ago about a man named Charles Blondin. And you heard this story before, but I'm going to share it again because I think it's a very fascinating story. And I love it. And people were, he asked people to trust him. Here's how the story goes. Um, the 19th century, Charles Blondin was a great tightrope walker the greatest tightrope walker in the world. On June 30th, 1859, he became the first man to historically walk on a tightrope across Niagara Falls. Over 25,000 people gathered to watch him walk the 1,100 feet suspended on a tiny rope, 160 feet above the raging water. He worked without a net or safety harness of any kind. The slightest slip would prove fatal. When he reached the other side, the Canadian side of the falls, the crowd burst 
into cheers and a mighty roar. In the days that followed, he would walk across the falls many times. He once walked across them on stilts. Another time he took a chair and a stove and sat down midway and cooked an omelet. He carried his manager across on riding piggyback. And once he pushed a wheelbarrow across loaded with 350 pounds of cement. On one occasion, he asked a cheering spectator this question. Uh, he asked if he could push a man across sitting in the wheelbarrow. There was a mighty war of approval. The crowd was cheering. Sir, do it. Uh, you think you could, uh, I could safely carry you across in the wheelbarrow? Yes, of course. Get in. The great blondin replied with a smile. But the man refused. It's an interesting story. What would you have done in that circumstance? If you had seen him do this several times, carrying others and making meals and just having fun out there, would you trust him? Would you be able to get into that wheelbarrow? Or would you have the same hesitations that this man did? It makes it clear, doesn't it? One thing, it's one thing to believe a man can walk across by himself. It's another to believe that he could safely carry you across. But it's something entirely different to get into the wheelbarrow by yourself. Believing in Jesus is like getting into that wheelbarrow. It's entrusting all that you are to all that he is. And when the Apostles' Creed begins with the word, I believe, it's a strong statement. It doesn't say, we believe. That's a simpler thing to say. True belief. True belief is always personal. I can't believe for you, and you can't believe for me. The church is more than uh, a gathering of people or a collection of Christians. At its heart, it is a community of believers who are joined together in a common faith in Jesus Christ. True belief is very personal. That's why the first part of the Apostles' Creed starts with, I believe. It's meant to be personal. It's meant to declare. And then it moves on to the second part. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. God is the creator. As I was preparing this, I was drawn to the word creator. And I thought of Genesis 1 bringing back the beginning of everything. Genesis 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered it. Then the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that light was good. And then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night, and evening passed. And morning came, Mark in the first day. And I could go on and read more of the passage, but it describes how God created everything. Everything that we can experience when we walk out of here. And the beauty and the purity that comes with that. We learn. We can learn from science about our world. And science sometimes figures they've got it all figured out with their theories of how the world began. Take one scientist having a conversation with God. He says to them, God, we don't need you anymore. Science has fig finally figured out the way to create life out of nothing. We can now do all that you did in the beginning. Oh, is that so, says God. Yes, said the scientist. We can take dirt and form it into human likeness and breathe into it, thus creating man. 
That's very interesting, God said. Show me. So the scientist reached down and grabs a handful of dirt and starts to mold the soil into the shape of a man. No, 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 no. God interrupts. Get your own dirt. The point is that God was the first one to do this. He is our creator. This is the start. This is where relationship with God begins. This is the one that he has identified as in the Apostles' Creed. In the Creed, God has given only one statement out of twelve. But as God, maybe that's all he needs. We call God by many names, but the composer of this creed chose a relational term and an occupational term. Father is a relational term. It's also a term of action. The creator is an occupational term, but it also has action. Let me say that again. Father is a relational term of being, yet it is also of action. And the creator is an occupational term of action, yet it is also of being. There are two parts of God's nature, and God must always be understood as in relationship. The Father is, and the Creator does. Both have something to do with us, so both should be acknowledged. When I look at God, our Father, that's how Jesus often referred to him. When he went and he prayed in Gethsemane, or he prayed at other times, it was always our Father. And it was in front of the disciples so that they would learn that as well. He claimed oneness with him as well. He is the Father of Jesus. But he's also the Father of Adam and all humankind. The difference is between Adam and Jesus is that Adam was created. Jesus has always been. Many of you know my relationship with my father has not really been the best or even existent. So it's hard for me to relate sometimes to that word father. But God is my father. And I'm still trying to figure out what it looks like from him. And I have an amazing example in my heavenly father. Because he is the ultimate father for everyone. In his story, or in his book, The Case for Creator, Lee Strobel wrote about facts about God as he uh, created both the heavens and the earth. To quote him, Earth's location, its size, its composition, its structure, its atmosphere, its temperature, its internal dynamics, and its many intricate cycles are all essential to life. The carbon cycle, the oxygen cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the sulfur cycle, the calcium cycle, the sodium cycle, and so on, testify to the degree which our planet exists and is precariously balanced. As for the heavens, their design is also remarkable. According to Strobel's research, the moon stabilizes the tilt of the Earth's axis and if the moon were not there, then our tilt would swing wildly over a large range, resulting in major temperature swings. If our tilt were likely 60 degrees, uh, the North Pole would be exposed to the sun for six months, and then vice versa. The South Pole would be in darkness the entire time. Instead, of, it varies only about one and a half degrees, just a tiny variation because gravity from the moon keeps our orbit stabilized. When you think about how all this works together, it's amazing. God's orientation for each one of us and how he created this. We should be in awe every time we step out the door in the morning. I know I was this morning as I saw the sunrise come up. It was beautiful. 
as it was painting across the sky. But I got a different experience about 11 years ago when Becky and I went to Hawaii. And one thing I noticed there was that either the sunrise or the sunsets were different. There wasn't that beautiful coloring that we normally get to see. It maybe was there for about five or ten minutes, but when the sun went down, it was dark. I missed that. It's not something that I was used to. Sure, it was beautiful there, but I love our sunsets. I love our sunrises. God has given us a magnificent place to live. And showing our appreciation is an amazing thing too. Max Lucado said, Who has more reason to worship than the astronomer who has seen the stars, than the surgeon who has held a heart, than the oceanographer who has pondered the depths? The more we know, the more we should be amazed. What amazes you about creation? Have you spent time contemplating and thanking God for that? It is truly a blessing to experience. However, sometimes when life is at its most difficult, we can lose that perspective. It's easy to lose sight of the trees because of the immensity of the forest before us. That's when we need to most remember. Look at the world around you and rejoice that the creator of the universe knows your situation that he knows you and that he's there for you. He wants a relationship with you. That God understands your fears, your hopes, your dreams, even your pains. Remember, God's wisdom is unsearchable and God's power is unmatched. Remember, you are and you rest in God's holy presence. Look up at the stars and receive the gift of perspective. God is so big, and we are so small. And yet God is holding you in the palm of his hands. God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, this is not all we know of God. To be sure, but the authors of the creed felt that this was enough to clarify who God is within our beliefs and within the Christian faith. Does it seem limited to you? Does it make God seem small? If it does, then consider for yourself what you know of God and whether or not you are limited in your own perspective. I challenge you this week to take some time and ask God to reveal more of himself to you in ways that you never have imagined. That you might be able to declare your own belief to him who is Father, Creator, and Sustainer. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are the creator, that there's so many things that we can explore and so many things that we can experience and that you love us, that you sent your son for us. So Lord, help us to understand a deeper view of what you've done for each one of us, how you're working in our lives, how you're leading us, how you're guiding us. And Lord, may that strengthen us and encourage us. And may we be able to testify of that to family and friends this week as we meet and talk with them. So Lord, we thank you for that statement. We thank you for the statement that you gave, declaring that you are creator of heaven and earth. And Lord, we do believe in you. We believe that you are the God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. In this we pray. Amen.